These are the answers to the chapter 13 packet, Properties of Solutions. Section 13.1, the solution process. A homogeneous mixture is also known as a solution. So we can see that the ability of substances to form solutions depends on two factors. Number one, the natural tendency of substances to mix and spread into larger volumes. And number two, the types of intermolecular attractions or interactions involved in the solution process. The mixing of gases is a spontaneous process, meaning it occurs of its own accord without any input of energy from outside the system. Entropy is a topic that will be explored in more detail in chapter 19. So as we look on page 790 in the textbook, we see a brief summary of entropy. In general, entropy is associated either with the extent of randomness in a system or with the extent to which energy is distributed among the various motions of the molecules of the system. So that's our definition of entropy from page 790. Two different gases, no matter if they're polar or nonpolar, will mix spontaneously with each other when they are combined in one container. This can be explained because the intermolecular forces in gases are too weak to prevent the molecules from mixing with each other. When a solution is formed, there are three kinds of interparticle interactions involved. First, we have solute-solute interactions that must be overcome before the solute particles can be dispersed throughout the solvent. Second, we have solvent-solvent interactions that must be overcome to make room for the solute particles. And then finally, we have solvent-solute interactions that are formed as the particles mix together. Remember that breaking bonds or breaking attractive forces is an endothermic process, but forming attractive forces or forming bonds is an exothermic process. So the two substances that are being mixed together in part G are pentane and heptane. These are both nonpolar hydrocarbons. So London dispersion forces are all that we have going on here we'd have to break some London dispersion forces between these molecules separately, and then we'd have to form London dispersion forces between pentane and heptane as the mixture is produced. For sodium chloride, we're having to break sodium chloride, that would be ionic bonds in the solute, since water is the solvent and has mostly hydrogen bonds as the dominant force, that would be broken. And then we are forming attractive forces between ions and polar water molecules. So we're forming ion dipole forces as the solution is produced. Interactions between solute and solvent are known as solvation. But more specifically, when water is the solvent, we call that hydration. Sodium chloride dissolves in water, but it does not dissolve in nonpolar solvents such as hexane or gasoline or oil because the attractive forces between nonpolar hexane and these ions like sodium and chloride are very weak. So therefore, whatever energy is required to break apart the ions in sodium chloride is not recovered in the formation of ion hexane interactions. So the attractive forces are too weak to drive the formation of the solution or the mixture. Here we have a variety of attractive forces that we have to talk about, and we're talking about forming attractive forces between solute and solvent. If two substances like turpentine and toluene are nonpolar hydrocarbons, then we're talking about London dispersion forces. Bromoethane and acetonitrile are both polar, but there's no hydrogen bonding. So polar molecules form dipole-dipole forces. Acetic acid and water both contain hydrogen bonding forces, and they would be forming as they mix together. And then potassium nitrate dissolving in water would form ion dipole forces. 
For part L, let's take a look at the figure on page 517. In the diagram on the left, we have an exothermic solution process. We can see that the solvent and the solute start at a certain level, but the solution finishes at an enthalpy level that is lower than where it started. So the final difference between the solute and solvent and the solution leads to a delta H that is less than zero. So a negative delta H is an exothermic process. So exothermic, the sign of delta H of solution is negative. The total energy that is absorbed when the solvent solvent and solute solute interactions are broken is less than the energy that is released when the solute and the solvent form interactions with each other. Now if we compare the diagram on the left with the diagram on the right, we see that we actually finish at a higher enthalpy level than where we started. So now the overall delta H of solution is positive. We have an endothermic solution process. So endothermic, the sign of delta H of solution is positive. The total energy that is absorbed when solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions are broken is greater than the energy that is released when the solute and the solvent form interactions with each other. The last little part of section 13.1 reminds us that sometimes a solution can be formed in a physical way, like dissolving salt in water, and sometimes it's more of a chemical change. So we're not just taking a bottle of nickel chloride and dissolving it in water. We're actually forming nickel chloride when nickel metal dissolves in hydrochloric acid. So it is a chemical change. And as we produce a solution of nickel chloride, and then we allow that solution to evaporate the water and turn it to a dry salt, what we end up with is not just nickel chloride, it turns out it's actually a hydrate, nickel 2 chloride hexahydrate, and you can see this in figure 13.6. The reaction between nickel metal and hydrochloric acid is not just a simple dissolution, but a chemical reaction. So nickel gets oxidized and hydrogen gets reduced, and we end up with this final dry salt, this green substance on the right, which is nickel chloride hexahydrate. All right, on to section 13.2, saturated solutions and solubility. You may recall from chapter four that some substances are non-electrolytes, so when they dissolve in water, they do not break up into ions. That's what happens with sucrose. It dissolves in water, but it stays intact as molecules of sugar. And then other substances do split up, dissociate, break apart into ions. So potassium bromide would produce individual potassium and bromide ions when dissolved in water. Now why do we have double arrows for this process? Well, it's because we have an equilibrium between the dissolution process and the crystallization process. So the dynamic equilibrium that we're talking about is the two opposing processes that occur at the same rate. There's the formation of the solution or dissolution, and then there's the formation of the solid, which can be called crystallization. So that process occurs in which you have some of the particles actually coming out of solution, and that happens at the same rate. So the two opposing processes are dissolution and crystallization. The word solubility can be defined in your textbook as the amount of solute needed to form a saturated solution in a given quantity of solvent at a certain temperature. And supersaturated is a very specific term that refers to what happens when a solution contains a greater amount of solute than is needed to form a saturated solution. That normally is produced by heating a solution, forming a saturated solution, and then allowing it to cool. And if it's cooled carefully, sometimes you can have a solution that actually has more solute than should normally fit at that particular temperature. 
Now as far as supersaturated solutions, we'll see that in the class as an example. We'll see that with a demonstration using sodium acetate. So in figure 13.9, that's what they're showing you. There's a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate and they initiate this crystallization process. So all these crystals of sodium acetate start forming and the beaker or the flask becomes quite warm. That means that the process of dissolving the sodium acetate in the first place was endothermic and the reverse of that, which is the crystallization, the forming of solid sodium acetate is exothermic. So one application of this is you can get these little gel packs that contain super saturated sodium acetate and they are hand warmers. So you can squeeze a corner of the bag of super saturated solution and it initiates this rapid crystallization and it gets warm for you know a few minutes and then you can pop it in the microwave and re-dissolve the salt again and you can reuse these little packs over and over again. All right, we're still talking about factors that affect solubility, but we've moved into section 13.3. Part A, explain why xenon gas is more soluble in water than helium gas. So both xenon and helium are nonpolar. Therefore, the attractive forces between the gas particles and the water molecules are London dispersion forces. Why would xenon be more soluble than helium? Because xenon is larger, has more electrons, and is more polarizable than helium. So the attractive forces between xenon and water are greater than the attractive forces between helium and water. So in terms of mixing two chemicals together, sometimes a practical application is you want to dissolve something, whether that's for cleaning or making a solution. In this case, you want to remove a sticky adhesive residue. So this product that contains petroleum distillates contains a bunch of nonpolar hydrocarbons. And so greasy stains and residues are also full of nonpolar substances. So if you have nonpolar materials and you mix them together, they can form a good solution. So when you have grease or oil or other kinds of residues, oftentimes they dissolve in a nonpolar solvent and they make a good solution for cleaning up messes or dissolving stains. So two nonpolar things mix really well together. What about two polar substances like alcohol and water? They're going to form attractive forces, and in this case, specifically hydrogen bonding forces with each other. So the ethanol molecules and the water molecules form attractive hydrogen bonding interactions with each other, and they can dissolve and mix quite well. In terms of polarity and intermolecular forces, the two liquids in figure 1310 are hexane and water, and they don't mix. They form two layers. Well, hexane is nonpolar and water is polar, so the attractive forces between hexane and water are limited to weak London dispersion forces, and it's difficult to break up the strong hydrogen bonding between water molecules. So the attractions between water and hexane are not strong enough to allow the formation of a solution between hexane and water. So in part E, we see that just because you contain an OH group, which is supposed to form hydrogen bonds with water, doesn't necessarily mean that all molecules that contain an OH group would be soluble in water. So here's the problem with hexanol. Hexanol contains six carbons. Now that six carbons, that's a pretty nonpolar region of that molecule. So while the OH group is an important part of the methanol molecule, which contains only one carbon, hexanol containing six carbons in a row with an OH group at the end, that one OH group is actually a rather small part of the hexanol molecule. So hexanol behaves more like hexane, a simple nonpolar hydrocarbon, and the solubility of hexanol in water is going to be much less than the solubility of methanol. So in general, as you increase the length of the carbon chain, you make that molecule increasingly more nonpolar and therefore less soluble in water. What would hexanol dissolve in? Well, probably a nonpolar solvent would be better. So hexanol would dissolve much more in hexane 
than methanol would. Letter G, explain the meaning of the phrase like dissolves like. Well, it's pretty simple. It means that nonpolar solutes will tend to dissolve in nonpolar solvents, whereas ionic and polar solutes would dissolve in polar solvents. And that is a general trend. And as it says here in your packet, do not give as your primary reason for why two things mix or do not mix the like dissolves like. It's a phrase that is not an explanation. You have to be more specific about the polarity of the solute and the solvent and mention the specific type of intermolecular forces that are involved. Just saying like dissolves like is not going to earn you credit on the AP exam or on a test in my class. So we've talked about polarity, but another important factor affecting solubility has to do with pressure. As the partial pressure of a gas above a solvent increases, how does this affect the solubility of that gas? Well, it's going to increase. We know this from experience with things like soda. When they package the soda at the factory, whether it's in a bottle or a can, they put it under a higher pressure. That's a higher pressure of carbon dioxide. And then when that pressure goes down, the solubility of the carbon dioxide in the soda is going to decrease. So when the pressure goes up, the solubility of the gas also goes up. When the pressure goes down, the solubility of the gas also goes down. So before you open up a bottle of soda, you don't see many bubbles in the solution unless you shake it up. But after you open the bottle of soda, bubbles are more visible in the solution, and that's because when you decrease the pressure by opening the bottle, this causes the solubility of the CO2 to decrease, and therefore as bubbles of CO2 are leaving the solution, they become visible. In general, we would expect something like potassium nitrate, which is a regular ordinary salt, an ionic material. It tends to be an endothermic uh, solution process. It's going to increase its solubility at a higher temperature. So you can fit more potassium nitrate at a higher temperature, its solubility goes up. On the other hand, gases, their solubility tends to decrease at higher temperatures. And that's because at higher temperatures, you're actually adding more kinetic energy, which causes the gas molecules to move faster and they're more easily able to escape the liquid. So gases become less soluble at higher temperatures. For many salts, they become more soluble at higher temperatures. So potassium nitrate, more soluble as the temperature increases, whereas oxygen gas becomes less soluble as the temperature increases. Explain why bubbles tend to form on the inside wall of a pot when water is heated on the stove, even though the te water temperature is well below the boiling point of water. So those bubbles are not beginning the process of boiling, they're simply driving out the gas, and that gas is typically dissolved air. So there is a certain amount of air dissolved in the water. When you turn on the faucet, there's going to be some bubbles. So that air, that solubility tends to decrease so as you raise the temperature of the water, you are driving the air out of the solution, and that's what you're seeing on the side of the pot as you heat it. Section 13.4 and 13.5 are entitled Expressing Solution Concentration and Colligative Properties. I've already taught you about molarity, and we are not looking at molality on the AP exam. So calculations of molality or percent by mass and percent by volume are not mentioned on the AP exam. Understanding how to work with solutions and dealing with molarity, we've already done that from chapter four. And in the last section, 13.6 on colloids, again, it's interesting material but not included on the AP chemistry exam. So that represents the end of this presentation and the end of the chapter 13 packet. I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching.